morning, church family. We are so glad you have chosen to worship with us. Just want to remind you that if you have not yet filled out one of our connection cards, whether it's your first time with us or your 87th time with us or your information has just changed, please fill out one of those so we can have the most accurate information possible. And if you or someone you know is in need of prayer, please fill out one of our prayer cards. We'd love to pray for you as a staff. Just a couple announcements before we get started. First off, we have our blessing box. This is a huge blessing to so many people in the community. And especially this time of year, it seems to get hit a little bit harder. So if you or someone you know would like to donate non-perishable food items to that, uh, just drop it off whenever you can. Again, the, this is a ministry that has affected so many people for the better, and we are so grateful for everybody who has given. Just want to let you know that's something we continue to do. We have been so excited to be back in the full swing of things for Spark and Stoke. But just a reminder that Stoke is not meeting this week, sadly, but we will be kicking it off again next week at 7 to 8.30 for all of our middle school and high school friends. But for all of our pre-K through first grade friends, we are still on Having Spark every single Thursday from 6 to 7.30, and we cannot wait to see all of you guys there. Attention music lovers, want to remind everybody that today at 4 o'clock, there's going to be a jazz concert featuring Svetlana Stone. This is going to be an amazing concert with the refreshments afterwards. Uh, if you are a music lover, this is something I think will be very, very beneficial for you to come to, and it's going to be a great concert. Hope to see many of you there. Fall Festival is coming up so soon, October 9th from 3 to 7 p.m. We are so excited for this event. As you can tell, we've been talking about it for such a long time, and we have a board out just so you guys can see what we need donated for this event. Um, you can pick up one of those things and bring it back right before the event. We need a lot of help for this, whether it be donations, financial, or bodies there the day of. So if you'd like to help, just contact me and we'll get you plugged in. And other than that, spread the word about this event. We are so excited to see you all there. Lastly, just wanted to let you know that we are going to be partnering with the Women's Service League of Southwest Michigan. They're doing a coat drive during the month of October, and they're going to have a donation bin here. So if you have or come across extra coats that you're not using, please consider bringing those in and donating them. Uh, this is an amazing opportunity for us to help out people in our community, especially as the weather gets a little bit colder. Uh, so please consider doing that. Now let's continue to worship together. Good morning, church. Oh, wow. Okay. Let's try that one more time. Rewind. Good morning, church. There we go. Stand up with me as we're about to start our first song. You know, the one thing I will, I was thinking about when we were practicing this earlier today I'm thinking of this piece, The House of the Lord, and the lyrics. There's, I love singing. I love the congregational, the, the music, the melodies, the sounds. But sometimes when you stop and think about the words and what they mean, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. I, I want to try something a little bit different this morning. I want you, to, I'm going to sing the chorus and it's just going to be, I want you to listen to what it says and what it actually means when we shout your praise, when the joy is in the house of the Lord, that we are in his house. And then, of course, the song will start, and I want you to join in, and I want you to say those words and what they mean to you. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. Oh, we shout your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is truly in this place. And we won't be quiet. Oh, we shout your
quiet. We shout your praises, Lord, in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout. I hope you feel that God now is here with us because he is. And in that understanding, with God being in the house with us, we know that we're not able to stand on our own two feet, that in the end, it is only in Christ alone that we're allowed to stand. Not that we're able to stand, but allowed to stand because we are not worthy. So as you're singing this, once again, think of what you're saying, what these words mean, the truth in these lyrics and what that means to you. In Christ alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are stilled when striving Sees my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. Oh,
What do those words mean to you? When you see that Christ calls you home. So when we sing this last bit of the song, have that personal conversation with God. If that means closing your eyes, getting a wonderful place, say that prayer to God. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I stand. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for reminding us that not only are we in your house this morning, whether we are physically here or distant, that you are always with us, that no matter how much we may try to believe that we can make it on our own, really it's only in Christ alone. When we say the words till you return and call us home, here in the power of Christ we stand, Lord, your love, your blood, and your beautiful ways of looking at us, our imperfections, our mistakes, our sins, and you see past all of that, Lord. Thank you so much for waking us up this morning. Bless the words that we're going to be hearing throughout today. And may your blessings nourish us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. I hope you're glad to be in the house of the Lord today. I'm glad you've chosen to be in this house. Uh, whether you're in, worshiping with us in person or if you're worshiping online with us, we welcome you and we thank you for choosing to worship with us. And I hope you experience the love and grace and truth of Jesus Christ in your, in your life today as you worship with us today. Um, I'm going to dismiss the kids here in a second. Uh, but before we do, I just want to, uh, I'm going to ask you to just say a big shout out and say happy birthday to my son Thaddeus. So say, if you want. <laughs> It's his birthday today, he turned 12, and it does not very often his birthday falls on a Sunday, so. All right, at this time, the kids are dismissed to kids' church, and for those of us that remain, let us continue to worship the Lord, and just have a great day, and a, and a time worshiping the Lord today. Um, I will just remind you that there is a concert here at 4 o'clock today, I hope you'll come back and uh, be a part of that uh, uh, jazz concert, and I also want to remind you as you leave, there's... Um, poster boards back there that you can help you can take some stuff off and help us with the fall festival that's coming up on October 9th um, we're going to need a lot of people volunteering to help that day and a lot of people providing money or, or supplies for the games and the food and all that stuff but it's going to be a great day and a great time and I hope you'll I hope you'll come to that event I hope you invite your friends and your neighbors to that event as well um, it's going to be a great outreach and a wonderful day to just hang out with people from the church and the community and have a great time together um, let's continue to worship the Lord. We're going to read, I want to read a scripture passage for, for you today. It comes from Galatians uh, chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. It says this, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he was wrong. He had been eating with the Gentiles before certain people came from James. But when they came, he began to back out and to separate himself because he was afraid of the people who promoted circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also joined him in this hypocrisy. So that even Barnabas got carried away with them in their hypocrisy. Today we're going to be continuing the Godly habit series. And if you remember last week, uh, the first habit I wanted to get you in the, in the habit of doing is, is hang time with God. Find time to spend with God every day. And, and I tried to throw out lots of things that you could do while you're hanging out with God. I talked about you could gather with your brothers and sisters in Christ and worship God like we're doing now. You could read your Bible. You can pray. You can read a Christian book. You can watch a faith-based film. You can read a devotional. You can go for walks or hikes or go fishing. Get out into nature and just have some time and conversations with God. And I hope you do that, because there's nothing more I want for you than for you to spend a lot of time with your Creator and Savior and develop a wonderful and beautiful friendship with Him. And at the end of your life, to be able to look back and, and recall many 
wonderful experiences and conversations that you had with God and see how that relationship has transformed your life and made you a better person. But today we're going to be talking about the second letter in the HABITS acronym, the A. And that stands for accountability. And I hope that today you'll realize and, and be inspired that the, the habit I want you to get in the habit of is holding yourself accountable for your words, your actions, and your attitude. And you allowing other people to hold you accountable in areas. And actually allowing the Holy Spirit to convict your heart and hold you accountable for, for the poor decisions that you've made. Allowing yourself, others, and the Holy Spirit to hold you accountable. In this morning's passage, we see Cephas, who is another variation of Peter's name, the Apostle Peter. So we see the Apostle Peter comes to visit Paul and Barnabas while they're ministering to the people in Antioch. They're Gentile Christians. It's actually the first church that, that where the word Christian comes from. <laughs> the, the believers were first called Christians in Antioch. And what's interesting is that Cephas, when he first gets there, he's there and he's, he's preaching and teaching probably and, and just and, and enjoying the, the food and the meals and the fellowship and the social time with the Gentiles, with the Gentile Christians. But then all of a sudden James, the leader of the Jerusalem church, the mother church kind of say, if you want to put it that way, who's also the half-brother of Jesus Christ, sends some people up also that are Jewish Christians up to see how things are going too. And when they get there, Peter changes what he does. He stops eating with the Gentiles and starts only eating with the Jewish Christians. He, stops, he starts to distance himself and, and not socialize and fellowship with them. And the other Jewish Christians there be, began to do the same thing. They saw what Peter and, was doing and they copied him and they did the same thing. To the point where even Barnabas who was the one who went and found Paul and asked him to come to Antioch to minister to the Gentile Christians, is now withdrawing himself from the Gentile Christians too. And when Paul sees this thing that's not right, he calls, Paul, he calls Peter out for it. He holds his brother Peter accountable. Peter was being a hypocrite. Peter was being a hypocrite because he was willing to live like a Gentile and hang out with the Gentiles until those devout Jews showed up. And then he started acting differently. You know, it's kind of like when Christians are in church around their Christian friends, they act one way. But then when they're at school or the universities or in the workplace and around their non-Christian friends, they act a different way. We've all seen that, haven't we? Maybe that's us. <laughs> I don't know. But that's inconsistent. That's hypocrisy. We should be the same person <laughs> in Jesus Christ wherever we're at and with whoever we're with. And that's kind of the hypocrisy that Peter, that Peter was displaying there. Many scholars also believe that these events took place after the Jerusalem Council, which declared that faith in Jesus Christ was all that was necessary for salvation and that the, Jew, the Gentile Christians did not have to get circumcised and did not have to eat the Jewish kosher foods and didn't have to do the Jewish cleanliness laws in order to be saved. So Peter and the other Jewish Christians say that these people are their brothers and sisters in Christ, but then they refuse to eat with them, to socialize with them, and fellowship with them because they haven't been circumcised or because they don't follow this dietary law or these cleanliness laws. That's, that's treating them as second-class Christians. And that's just wrong. They're being hypocrites. They're being inconsistent in applying the Christian teachings and faith to daily living. So Paul calls them out to this. In verse 14, it says this, But when I saw that they weren't acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I confronted them. And so Paul confronts Peter in front of everybody, and he points out this inconsistency, this hypocrisy. 
And he calls Peter and Barnabas and all those Jewish Christians to task. He holds them accountable. I'm going to guess that they changed their actions and their ways after that. The Bible actually, actually doesn't tell us how they responded or what they did. I'm just hopeful, I guess, that they did <laughs> and that they changed their ways. But here's the point. If the Apostle Peter, who was one of the greatest leaders in the Christian church at this time and was one of the best friends of Jesus Christ, and Barnabas, who was known as the, 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 the Apostle of, of Encouragement, the, 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 the great encourager, and, and he went with Paul on all these missionary journeys to, to reach the Gentile world for Jesus Christ. If they need people to hold them accountable and to, to live, so that they can live a more consistent Christian faith and life, what about us? Don't you think that we might need accountability in our life too? Let me give you another example from the Old Testament of someone that holds people accountable for their decisions and their actions. I want to take you back to a story in Exodus with Moses and his brother Aaron, who's the high priest, and to the Israelites. If you were in Sunday school, you probably heard this story before. It's from Exodus 32. I want to read to you verses 1 through 8. It says this, When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them here to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of, of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are the gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to worship this calf. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented uh, fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in much revelry, a big party. <laughs> then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt, have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are the gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. So then if you continue to read the chapter, you see Moses goes down. And when he sees what the Israelites are doing, he throws the, 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 the tablets that he has, which are the Ten Commandments on him. He throws them to the ground and they shatter to pieces. And the scriptures say, then he grabbed that golden calf and he melted it down. And I'm guessing he let it start to solidify again. And as it was solidifying, he, pow he, he turned it into gold powder. And then he put it in the water and he made the Israelites drink it. He said, drink this, you idiots, <laughs> for doing this. What you did was wrong, it was bad. And to punish you, I'm going to make you drink this awful tasting stuff that has gold powder in it. And then he turns to his brother, Aaron, who's the high priest. And he says this, what did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? What did you do? Why did you lead these people into such great sin, Aaron? Moses holds his brother, who's the high priest of Israel, accountable for him giving in to peer pressure and doing something wrong and leading the whole nation of Israel into idolatry. Moses also holds the Israelites accountable by making them, by kind of punishing them for their, for their decision to worship another god. And if you continue to read the chapter, Moses then goes back up to the mountain and, and he's begging God to forgive the Israelites for, for their stupid choice, for their sin. And I want to read you the last two verses of the chapter. This is God's response to, 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 to Moses when Moses is asking and begging for their forgiveness. This is what God says. When the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sin. And then the Lord struck the people with a plague because of what they did with the calf Aaron had made. 
In this passage, we see Moses holding Aaron, the high priest, accountable for his sins. In this passage, we see Moses holding the Israelites accountable for their sins. And we also see God holding the people accountable for their decisions, their actions, for their idolatry. If Aaron, the high priest, needs someone to hold him accountable, and as I mentioned earlier, as, we, as Peter and Barnabas need someone to hold them accountable so they can live out the Christian faith more genuinely, more consistently. What about us? Don't we need accountability in our lives as well? I believe we do. We're all human. We all make mistakes. We all have selfish and sinful desires inside us that lead us astray when we give in to them. Sometimes we don't even realize that our decisions are inconsistent with the Christian faith. Or we don't realize how our decisions are impacting and hurting others. And we need someone to point that out to us. Sometimes we don't realize how dangerous our choices are. And the consequences that may result from those decisions. That's why we need people to speak truth into our lives. That's why we need others to point out our inconsistencies and our hypocrisies and our sins. You know, when John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, went off to college, he went to Oxford University, and, and at this point, Israel, uh, Israel, gosh, England was moving further and further away from God, and so were the universities. A lot like we're in kind of the same situation we're in today in America, right? And so... John Wesley, he says, you know what, I don't want to, get, to go off to college and come out less of a Christian than what I was when I started. So he formed this thing called the Holiness Club and got about 25 other people at Oxford to join him in this Holiness Club. And in this club, they committed to basically holding each other accountable, holding themselves accountable and allowing those people in the group to hold them accountable. And they had a desire to grow closer to God. And I wanted to share with you some of the things that these people committed to that were part of this group. First of all, they'd gather together every day for three hours of prayer. Raise your hand if you're ready to commit to that. That's a lot. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready to do that. <laughs> I don't think I am. You know, but they would get together for three hours a day and pray. They would gather every Sunday and take communion, when back then it was only required every six to eight weeks. But they wanted to remember what Jesus Christ did for them on the cross every week. And they gathered together to take Holy Communion. A lot like we do here at this service. They fasted every Wednesday and every Friday. They would go visit prisons and share the good news of Jesus Christ with those that are in prison. They would regularly go out and help take care of the sick. And they eventually came up with 22 questions that they would ask themselves and ask each other every day. I want you to hear these 22 questions. They're amazing. I wish more people would ask themselves these questions or these type of questions. But here's the questions that they would ask each other every day to hold themselves accountable. Am I consciously or unconsciously creating the impression that I am better than I really am? In other words, am I a hypocrite? Question two, am I honest in all my acts and words, or do I exaggerate? Do I confidentially pass on to another what was told to me in confidence? Can I be trusted? Am I a slave to dress, friends, work, or habits? Am I self-conscious, self-pitying? Or self-justifying. I love this one. Did the Bible live in me today? And the next one. Did I give the Bible time to speak to me today? Next question. Am I enjoying prayer? Am I enjoying my conversations with God? Question 10, when did I last speak to someone else about my faith? Question 11, do I pray about the money I spend? Do I let God, no, do I let God have a say in how I spend the money that he gives me? 
Or do I make all those decisions? Question 12, did I get to bed on time and get up on time? Next one, do I, dis, do, uh, do, do I disobey God in anything? Do I insist upon doing something about which my conscience is uneasy? I might rephrase it and say, am I starting to go in those kind of gray areas in life? Things that I'm not quite sure about, but, man, they might be really fun. <laughs> I might want to try it. Am I doing something my conscience is uneasy about? Maybe just to fit in, whatever that might be. Next question, am I defeated in any part of my life? Is Satan in this world and sin defeating me in a certain area? And do I need to focus on that area? Do I need to grow? Do I need help in that area? Am I jealous, impure, critical, irritable, touchy, or distrustful? How do I spend my spare time? Am I using my free time wisely? Am I proud? Do I thank God that I am not as other people, especially as the Pharisees who despise the publican? Is there anyone whom I fear, dislike, disown, criticize, hold resentment toward, or disregard? And if so, what am I doing to resolve that? Do I grumble or complain constantly? And then the last one I love to, is Christ real to me? Is Christ real to me or am I just going through the motions? When I look at that list, I'm like, wow. What a great set of questions to ask yourself every day to hold yourself accountable. And I wish more Christians would ask themselves these questions or questions like this. Ask yourself these questions every day as they did. I wish more of us would hold ourselves accountable for our words, our actions, and our attitudes. I wish more of us would allow others to hold us accountable, to speak truth, to point out inconsistencies in our lives, in our living out of the Christian faith. Now, I believe if we would hold ourselves accountable for our words, actions, and attitudes, and if we allowed friends and family to hold us accountable for our decisions and our words and our actions, we would be better people. We'd be more genuine and mature Christian believers, wouldn't we? I believe John and Charles Wesley believed this, because after they got out of college, guess what they spent most of their life doing? They went around setting up what we call, mission, what we call now uh, Methodist societies. And they set up these Methodist societies all over England and all over America when they were over here doing missions. And I want to just read you, give you a little bit of information, because we don't really have a lot of Methodist societies. Even when we're a Methodist church, we don't really see a lot of Methodist societies in our world and culture today. But this is what the Methodist societies were supposed to be doing. The purpose of the Methodist society was to support one another in the pursuit of holiness of heart and life. That was their mission. That was their motto. They were basically accountability groups that helped each other grow in the Christian faith and to the living out of God's commands. Another practical reason why I think we need others to hold us accountable is this. A lot of us struggle with something in life, don't we? I mean, there's people out there that struggle with alcohol. There's other people that struggle with, with with drugs, others struggle with pornography, others struggle with, with gossiping or swearing or lying, whatever it is. And I'm here to tell you, yeah, you might be able to overcome that sin or that struggle on your own, but I'm also here to tell you it'd probably be a lot easier if you had a friend or a group of people loving you, encouraging you, supporting you, praying for you, asking you, and holding you accountable to achieve that, to, to, get, to break that addiction, to overcome that sin. Let me give you an easy example. Have you ever tried to move a couch out of your, out of your house all by yourself? Yeah, if no, or if you tried, you realize how hard it is. It is really difficult. It's just too long, too bulky, too odd. It's really difficult. You might, with a lot of energy and effort, you might be able to move a couch out of your house somewhere else all by yourself. 
But I'm telling you, it would have been a whole lot easier if we had asked a friend to help you and they could grab that other end and help you move it to wherever it needs to go. And the same is true with our Christian walk. Some things are just really hard and difficult to do on our own. And it would be so much easier if you invited a, a family member, a friend, a brother, a sister in Christ, and you got vulnerable and you got real with them and said, I'm really struggling with this. Can you help me? Would you, be, would you be willing to meet with me, pray with me, ask me, a question, ask me questions every day, every week, whatever it is that you need? But I think we as Christians, we, we so often try to do everything on our own, especially in the American culture. We're taught to be autonomous and strong and free and independent and all that stuff. When I really think God made us, yeah, we're supposed to be that way, but we're also supposed to be interdependent. You know, we're, we're, we're created to be dependent upon God and interdependent with each other in helping each other become the best versions of ourselves that we can be. So I encourage you to hold yourself accountable for your words, your actions, your, your attitudes, and allow others that you know love you and care about you to hold you accountable too. And another person that we should also let hold us accountable is the Holy Spirit living inside you. I don't have a slide for this. I'm adding this. <laughs> it's something I thought about between services, and I just want to share it with you. You know, God gave us his Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us, didn't he? Have you ever done something and thought, oh, I shouldn't, do, I shouldn't have done that? Or you're contemplating something and you get this feeling, you shouldn't do that, don't do that. Or once you do it, you start feeling guilty and bad. That's the Holy Spirit. Trying to lead you and guide you to make good choices and lead you and guide you down those good paths. Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to speak truth into your life and hold you accountable? When he convicts you, when you do mess up and he convicts you, are you repenting of those sins and, and turning away from those bad actions and, and striving to do what is good and right the next time? Friends, I want to encourage you to hold yourself accountable for your words and your actions. Allow other people to hold you accountable and allow the Holy Spirit that is living inside you, that was given to you as a gift of God, to hold you accountable. Let me close with talking about one other thing about accountability. Why is accountability so important? The reason why you want to live a good Christian life while you're here on this earth is because one day God will hold you accountable for all your words and all your actions. And I know that's a scary thought, but it's, it's biblical. The Bible tells us that one day Jesus will return and we will all stand before the great white throne and we will all be judged. Let me read to you part of Revelation 20 and let these truths from the scripture passage sink into your life today. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, Standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. And anyone whose name was not written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. May we all live accountable lives because we're going to have to give an account for that life someday before God. I pray that you hold yourself accountable. I hope and pray you allow family, friends, and loved ones to hold you accountable, to speak truth in Christian ways and teachings into your life. And I hope you let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you and hold you accountable as well. May we get into the habit of holding ourselves accountable, allowing God and others to hold us accountable too as well. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the lives that you've given us. We thank you for the family and friends that you've given us, our brothers and sisters in Christ and the family of God that you've given us, the Holy Spirit that you've given us. These are all wonderful gifts. Lord, help us to live our lives here on this earth wisely and let us keep ourselves accountable. And may we 
allow our friends and families and members and those that we know love us and care about us and want what's best for us to hold us accountable to. And may we listen to that Holy Spirit that's living inside us. And when he convicts our hearts, I pray that we'd repent of our sins and turn back to you and get back on that path of right living. God, help us to see the importance and the value of accountability. And maybe get in the habit of practicing accountability. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of the questions that was in that 22 questions was, how am I handling my money? Am I allowing God, I can't say something, am I allowing God to have a say in my money? I don't like to talk about money a lot. But I'm just be honest, it takes your gifts, your donations to keep this church doors, these church doors open, to keep these ministries going. And I hope that you are thankful and grateful for the way God has blessed you and that out of love and out of thankfulness, you will give back to the church so that the church can then be a blessing to the people in this community and all over the world. We try hard to use that money wisely to, for ministries and missions and, the, and helping the poor and the needy and getting the good news of Jesus Christ out. So I pray that during this time, that during this song, that you'll think about what God wants you to give back to him and that you'll just be and then you'll just be obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And after the song, we'll take Holy Communion together. So if you did not grab elements, okay, the communion elements as you came in, please raise your hand and someone will bring those elements to you during this song. Now let's continue to worship the Lord. the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one king reigning over all, so I will not fear, though it's true. My God is the ancient of days. Not a
future brings. I will watch and wait for my Savior King, then my joy complete, standing face to face in the presence of the ancient. supposed to do that, Andrew. Get me crying. <laughs> it's kind of hard to stand up and cry and talk. <laughs> you know, we talked today about Peter withdrawing from eating a meal with other believers. I just got to say this, I'm grateful that God invites all of us, Jews, Gentiles, those that are seeking him, and he invites us all to come to the table and eat with him because he loves us all. And the first time he came, he came as that great lamb that was going to be the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of humankind. But he promises someday I'm going to come back as a roaring lion and as a king of kings and the lord of lords to judge all and to remove evil and sin from this world. It is during this lifetime, during this time, this age, that we are called to repent and place our faith in Jesus Christ for our salvation to find forgiveness from our sins, our mistakes, from our poor decisions. I invite you to take the bread and remember that this is the body of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And it was broken for you at Calvary because he loves you. And he wanted you to find forgiveness and grace and mercy at the throne of God. Let us take and eat and be thankful for what Jesus did for you. Peeling back that aluminum foil, the juice is there to remind us that the blood of Jesus Christ was poured out at Calvary to wash away your sins and mine, to pay that penalty. The penalty for sin was death. Someone had to die. And Jesus loved you so much as I don't want you to die. I'll die in your place. So that you can become children of God. So that one day when I come back, you can be with me at that great feast. What actually got me crying in the songs I started thinking about it was that feasting with God face to face and seeing the scars in his hands and in his side, knowing that he did that for me and for all humanity, for you. Sometimes we take that for granted. I hope we don't. May we be thankful for what Jesus did for us. And I hope tears of joy roll down your face when you see him face to face and you feast with your God and Savior, and you live with him forever and ever. Let us take and drink and be thankful. Let's pray. God, right now, we don't get to see you face to face. We just have to believe and trust your word and believe and trust your Holy Spirit. And we place our faith and trust in you, Jesus, for our salvation. And God, we are thankful you gave us your son. And Jesus, we are thankful that you died on the cross for our sins. And we look forward to that day when we do get to see you face to face. And we hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And we walk into your kingdom. And we feast with you and we live with you forever and ever. In perfect paradise. 
all because of what Jesus Christ did for us at the cross, and we place our faith and trust in him for our salvation. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for creating the church where we can gather and worship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now go with us as we leave this place. Go with us and lead us and guide us. Hold us accountable, God, and may we hold ourselves accountable. And may we invite our brothers and sisters in Christ to hold us accountable so that we become the men and women of God that you want us to be, that we become the church that you want us to be. And through our whole lives, Lord, may we give you all the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name. Good afternoon, church. <laughs> Good afternoon, church. Good afternoon. There we go. Stand with me as we do our last number today. And I want you to feel that love. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Thank you for congregating with us and coming in with doing communion with us. Thank you so much. And as we sing this last song before you leave, feel that greater love inside of you.
Go with God. Be blessed.